They have very literally gutted habeas corpus of all meaning. It needs to continue being in the forefront of any discussion of this country and the values that we have. That legal memo that John, you have prepared uh, specifically said that if you, we should use Guantanamo, and the reason uh, is because it would be outside of the law. The incredibly successful propaganda that was used by the Bush administration to tell the American people, cower in fear, we are here to save you. We have put the baddest of the bad guys, the worst of the worst, in Guantanamo, and you can all sleep safely now. Who are they, sir? You don't need to know that. My work for the last six years started with my anger at not being told by the United States government who they were holding in this prison. In the mainstream media, what we've seen is people noticing that there was an anniversary on and then moving along. Um, what we've seen is that a lot of people don't really care. And you know, the longer Guantanamo has gone on, um, we've seen a dropping off of interest in some ways. Uh, there are a variety of reasons for that. One is that it was very easy for people to mobilize uh, opposition against President Bush and former Vice President Dick Cheney. Um, and it's much more difficult what happened since President Obama was elected because, of course, he, he you know, promised to close the prison. He led many people to believe that was going to happen. He led many people to believe that that has happened. It didn't happen at all. It's now three years since he made that promise and the prison is still open. There seems to be a certain segment that truly does want to protect uh, Obama, President Obama, uh, not cast any blame on him and simply shift it to Congress. And I'm wondering if you can, in, in, in your research and your discussions, what do you think res the responsibility is of the president and what role uh, ha has he played in terms of, uh, you know, keeping Guantanamo open? Well, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the boldest move that President Obama made was on his second day in office when he issued an executive order promising that Guantanamo would be closed within a year and then kind of essentially did nothing. Uh, you know, the day after he should have been releasing people, there were, there were somewhere around 65 prisoners still held who had been cleared for release by military review boards under the Bush administration when Obama came into office. He could have released some of those guys, easily. But he did nothing. Well, you know, under Bush, it did, it did appear that the prisoners were being released. They, they were, you know, uh, when the landmark Supreme Court decision uh, uh, came down in which detainees, uh, prisoners had habeas corpus uh, rights, there were uh, hundreds of them that were, that were being released. There are 89 uh, that have been cleared, yeah. but they cannot uh, get out of them. Yeah, well, I mean, the ones who've been cleared, it's, you know, it's, it's, that's Congress's fault and the president's fault. So, you know, uh, just briefly, the other, the other great uh, blame must be laid at the president's feet for the refusal to release Yemenis, because after, after the guy, the Nigerian guy, Umar Farouk Abdul Mutalab, tried to blow himself up on the plane, and it was found that he was recruited in Yemen. When there was an uproar and the, and the president said, OK, I issue a moratorium on releasing anyone to Yemen. That was his fault alone. But he did that. And then Congress said, you can't release any Yemen. I wrote an article for, for Truthair, um, looking at, after the WikiLeaks documents came out, looking at how long some of these Yemenis have been cleared. There's some Yemenis in Guantanamo where the Bush administration said, we don't want to hold this guy anymore. In 2004, but they didn't get around to releasing them because they were worried about the security situation in Yemen. And then Obama's done the same thing. It means twice over, it means nothing to say to a prisoner in Guantanamo, we want to release you. It means the same thing as, you see this key here, I'm throwing it down the pan and you're never leaving it. It means the same thing. You cannot get out of that place. That's, that makes such a mockery of any concepts of justice in the law, shouldn't it? Perhaps they believe that if President Obama couldn't close it, there must be difficulties that, that we don't know, the kind of things that we mere mortals are not told about. In Washington, D.C. yesterday, um, when somebody, one of the journalists in the audience, I don't know where she was from exactly, uh, but she raised exactly this question, and I found myself quietly enraged. Um, so that at the end, I just, uh, I just made a statement about what she said, and, and to make the point that um, the dark secret that she was hinting there might be that there are these dark secrets that the president can't tell us about the truth about the prisoners of Guantanamo. 
But actually, it's much more uh, mundane than she was making out of some huge national security secret. Um, what it's about is uh, cruelty and incompetence and embarrassment. Um, it's about issues in which senior officials and senior lawyers um, are responsible for things that might rise to the level of war crimes. But above all, it's about, it's about the torture and abuse and coercion and bribery that was in Guantanamo, the creation of a kind of house of cards of evidence built out of nothing except the testimony of prisoners and their fellow prisoners who were abused or, or, or persuaded in other ways to produce what, what masquerades as the evidence. And that's the true secret. There's a high value detainee there, first one captured after 9 11. His name is, uh, goes by the name Abu Zubaydah. And I have asked his attorney what he had for lunch. Just a minor little detail. It's classified. Cannot even say, you know, what, what he has eaten. Uh, this was my, I mean, this was my point, and you know, I'm sure you can talk more about it, Jason, because you've done work on the case of Abu Zubaydah. But I think that one of the hidden secrets of Guantanamo now is these high-value detainees. Every single word, like Jason says, but everything of these guys, it remains classified. Nothing has been made unclassified. Why would that be? Would it happen to be coincidental that these are the guys who were held in secret CIA torture prisons for all these years, and that the government is determined to keep a lid on any mention of that whatsoever? And I can't see that there could possibly be any other conclusion. The WikiLeaks files that I mentioned contain more detail, not particularly about the prisoners themselves, but about um, what the government claims its allegations are against them and where they came from. And these are desperately important documents because they reveal that although at first glance you could look at the file of any prisoner and say there's a lot of information here, it must be a bad guy. When you examine it, you find that, that the same handful of people keep turning up. Unreliable witnesses in Guantanamo, mentally ill witnesses in Guantanamo, people who had decided for whatever reason, and I can understand it, that they were going to lie. They were going to tell lies about their fellow prisoners. Maybe they just didn't want the pressure anymore. Maybe they were told, how would you like to have some nice food every day? All of these things happen. And a handful of people, Abu Zubaydah's one, he keeps turning up regularly in these reports. He says, he might possibly have thought that maybe he recognized seeing this man in an Al-Qaeda or Taliban guest house. They're mostly incredibly vague and pointless comments made by Abu Zubaydah, who was held for years in torture prisons, where you just think, the poor guy. They just keep showing him the pictures. They had pictures of all the prisoners, photo albums. They call it the family album. And there they are every day with this poor guy. Who's he? Who's he? Who's he? You must know him. In the case of one Guantanamo prisoner who was free, uh, Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, former chief of staff to Colin Powell, he filed an affidavit, uh, a, a sworn declaration affidavit stating that uh, he knew that the vast majority were innocent, that Bush, Cheney, and Rumsfeld knew it, and for political PR reasons, they were, uh, uh, you know, they remained uh, at Guantanamo. At its peak, Guantanamo had, I mean, innocent people, many, many. Well, when those files came out last, um, last April, I mean, one of the things that the mainstream media picked up on in the week before Osama bin Laden was killed, so everyone forgot about the story then. But one of the things that some of the mainstream media outlets picked up on was they went through the files just reading, they must have been reading things very quickly. What can we pick out as to right, um, the assessments that were made? They make risk assessments and intelligence assessments of how significant people are. Um, and they worked out that at least 150 of the prisoners were completely innocent people. Um, now that's an understatement because, you know, it's actually more than that. Um, I would say that it's several hundred people. It's not entirely true to say that everyone was innocent. The, the, the problem is, and this strikes to the heart of the war of terror, really, is that many of these people were fighting for the Taliban or involved with the Taliban in some way. Um, in their military conflict with the Northern Alliance in Afghanistan, an inter-Muslim civil war that, that preceded the 9-11 attacks that had nothing to do with it. Afghanistan was sheltering Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, this small international terrorist organization. But the Bush administration deliberately equated the Taliban with Al-Qaeda. So they ended up with a lot of insignificant foot soldiers. The justification for holding these prisoners is what's called the authorization for use of military force, which was 
passed the week after the 9-11 attacks and authorized the president to do whatever he thought was appropriate to bring in anyone connected to Al-Qaeda, or that he thought was, or Which is currently being used to justify the, the, the drone war, which is taking right. place throughout the world. And to justify the senators' insane decision that they want mandatory military custody for all terror suspects, including Americans, which is derived from Guantanamo. And the justification is the authorization of use of military force. And, and the Supreme Court said in 2004 in a ruling, yeah, this allows you to hold these people to the end of hostilities as well. Well, you can hold soldiers until the end of hostilities according to the Geneva Conventions. So I think the AUMF actually is a unilateral rewriting of the Geneva Conventions to cover the detention of people in wartime, and nobody realizes, or if they do realize, they don't care. Well, I think that that's pretty disgraceful, actually, because soldiers should be held according to the Geneva Conventions and protected by those conventions, and terrorists are criminal suspects, and they should be tried in federal court trials. And we're left with the the same mess that we had under Bush, because President Obama hasn't tackled that. You know, all, he, all he's really done in legal terms, sorry, is, yeah. is that he stopped calling them enemy combatants. I mean, that's been, you know. It's belligerent now. Yeah, his, his advisor said, you know, illegal enemy combatants, that doesn't play well. You know, that's a, that's a bad term from the Bush administration. So let's call them these belligerents, because at least that wording comes out of the Geneva Convention. Moving back to the DC Circuit Court, yeah. I mean, that seems to be something obviously very new in which the, it does appear that the circuit court is simply gutting habeas. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, just to run through that quickly, the, the prisoners were given habeas corpus rights by the Supreme Court in June 2004. Why did the justices in the Supreme Court give wartime prisoners habeas corpus rights? Because they recognized that they didn't have the rights of the Geneva Conventions and that they were literally being held in a black hole. So, Bush, Bush's Congress uh, decides to try and um, revoke these habeas corpus rights. And it takes until 2008 when they, the prisoners get back in front of the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court says, Congress acted unconstitutionally. These guys have constitutionally guaranteed habeas corpus rights. The case is then started. The prisoners then were able to, to file their cases in front of district court judges in Washington, D.C., who all got together to decide how they were going to do it. They got together to decide what kind of standard was required to detain people because the Supreme Court hadn't spelled that out. Nobody really had ever properly spelled out what an enemy combatant meant. So the judges said, okay, well, we'll say that it means that you have to be part of Al-Qaeda and or the Taliban. So that fundamental problem I identified before, are you a terrorist or a soldier, wasn't addressed. You can be a soldier. You can be the guy who carried the toothbrush for a soldier. That would do. Or you can be, you know, somebody planning mass destruction on a huge scale. But at least they, at least they tried to codify what it meant. And then they started making decisions. And they had dozens of rulings where, where actually what you had was judges in the district court who were coming up with opinions that looked remarkably like what I and other people who have been looking at these cases close to the years have been saying, which was amazing. And it was such a vindication that they looked at the supposed evidence and said, this doesn't stand up. You see this guy here? He's mentally troubled. We've got your own report saying don't trust him. They identified these people who told lies about their fellow prisoners. They identified all of this. So a handful of prisoners were released. Somewhere around two dozen prisoners, I think, were released as a result of this process. I can't remember the exact figures. It might be a bit less than that, but somewhere around that. Then the government started appealing, and they started appealing, and the appeals go to the D.C. Circuit Court. And instead of the district court judges being able and, and, and it being appropriate for them to test the allegations made by the government and to balance those against the claims made by the prisoners, they've steadily, in ruling after ruling, been saying, you must give the presumption of accuracy to whatever nonsense the government comes up with. And we are hoping that, that the latest ruling will lead to an appeal to the Supreme Court that the Supreme Court will take up. Congress just uh, recently passed the National Defense Authorization Act and uh, Obama signed it into law on uh, New Year's Eve. At, at one point of that, by the way, there's been quite a bit of discussion uh, and debate and even protest revolving around the fact that U.S. citizens uh, could be detained and sent to Guantanamo. 
one thing that has not been discussed in this context is that indefinite detention is a human rights issue. Regardless of the fact that it involves Americans, uh, it's simply a human rights issue. I understand people's concern about, about this applying to U.S. citizens, and I absolutely understand that lawmakers had U.S. citizens in mind when they were doing <coughs> but they had foreigners in mind as well. And where it came from was Guantanamo, because it's been happening for 10 years in Guantanamo that foreigners have been thrown into a hole and held without charge or trial in indefinite military detention, mandatory. It's the same thing. So, you know, I can't... I can't believe that it ha I can believe it happened, but I believe what it really expresses is how out of touch your elected officials are with reality. And that, you know, that either they're scared and, um, and they're either disgraceful cowards or they're scaremongers. And I think most of them are scaremongers. They're playing their fear card. It's an insult to you. You know, we face in the West, in all of our countries, we face such grave economic problems at the moment. To have these idiots obsessing only about a spectral terrorism threat that they conjured up is a disgrace. Do you actually see any prisoners yeah. being well, released at this point? Let me move on to how that could happen, and I think it's where we, we all come in. So, the provisions that, that, that you may have heard about, um, and the, that some of you may know about in the NDA relating to the disposition or not of Guantanamo prisons, the intention's been there for at least a year since previous legislation to make sure that, that, that there is no way that anyone can be released from Guantanamo. So, those particular provisions, the, the, there's the first one that um, requires the Secretary of Defense to guarantee that if a prisoner is released, he will not be able to be involved in anti-American actions. You can't make that kind of guarantee. And the administration has said, you know, Jay Johnson, who's a senior Pentagon lawyer, said those are onerous and near impossible to satisfy, and that's entirely accurate. And it's deliberately so. The other one, not allowing anyone to be released to a country where there's an allegation that a single person from that country has engaged in any recidivist activities. In other words, that, uh, that any person released to a, to a country has, to, has taken up arms or is involved in terrorist activities or plotting against the United States. Um, how is that supposed to be fair? That's on the par with the guilt by nationality of the Yemenis, I think, where you can't be released from Guantanamo, not because of anything that you've done, but because you're a Yemeni. Well, that's it, yes. That's so unjust. Now, there is a glimpse of hope in this legislation that most people haven't noticed. There is a waiver in the legislation which was imposed, through, it was brought in just before the vote, through discussions that involve members of the administration, that if the president is prepared to, um, to tell Congress that he is satisfied he and his administration are satisfied that releasing a prisoner is safe. He does not have to jump through these impossible hoops. It means that the president has given himself and his administration the power to release prisoners. Now, will he do it? He looks unlikely to do it because anything that he does about Guantanamo rocks a boat that he doesn't want rocked and enables Republicans to speak up. But he could do it, and we can put pressure on him. And I think shame is where we're at now after 10 years of how can we persuade people with power and responsibility in this country and members of the American public who don't care. But I'm kind of thinking how we can make the decision makers care. That this is a shame and that it remains a shame because the prison could be closed. It could have been closed. And it hasn't because there's a lack of political will or there is deliberate political obstruction. And what I hope that we'll be able to achieve, those of us who care about this, is that we'll be able to focus on perhaps trying to take this message out to lawmakers individually to say, we know essentially that you people care about how you will be thought of. It isn't all just about short-term political gain and expediency. You want to be remembered as a good man or woman who tried to do a good job. You will not be remembered that way. No one in a position of responsibility will be in the United States if they consistently and persistently fail to close Guantanamo, because the longer it goes on, the more shameful it will be. Two people died there last year. Uh, the last living prisoner left over a year ago. After that, the last two people to leave were dead. They left in coffins. 
That will continue to happen. And if I could ask you to do one thing to show your solidarity, it's to sign up to the website that I established with some Guantanamo lawyers called Close Guantanamo, www.closeguantanamo.org.